Hi everyone, today we're going to be talking about Arthropoda, which is a phylum of invertebrate animals that we're going to be breaking up into two parts. In this first part, we're going to be talking about all Arthropoda, excluding trilobites. Trilobites are a major subphylum of Arthropoda that deserve their own video. So check back next time for the trilobite video. But in this video, let's go ahead and get started with talking about some of the background behind arthropods. Earth is a planet of arthropods. Arthropods are the most abundant diverse, and ecologically variable group of organisms on Earth. Arthropods make up to 99% of all species on Earth, and their success is likely due to rapid reproduction rates. For example, a single pair of cockroaches can produce 164 billion offspring in seven months under good conditions. That's a lot of cockroaches coming from a single pair. And the second reason they're so successful is because of their segmented body bodies, which is basically the common characteristic among all organisms in the arthropoda phylum. It is segmentation in their bodies, which allows them to specialize their skeletal functions and proliferate all sorts of different environments and habitats based on these different functions. And these habitats can include marine, terrestrial, or freshwater habitats, and they can also live in the air, as we see with flying insects. And in terms of environmental conditions, they can live in the hottest deserts, to the coldest ice, to the highest mountains and even as internal or external parasites. Some examples of really extreme environments that we find arthropods include hydrothermal vents or underwater volcanoes where very hot hydrothermal vent fluid comes out from these vents and mixes with the surrounding seawater and along these vents you have huge colonies of certain shrimp species that can proliferate in these environments and then you also have krill that can survive in a variety of different environments including very very cold ice covered water in polar regions. And the third key to their success is that they have exoskeletons and the ability to molt. As we can see here in this animation, as well as this one, we see that the arthropods have to molt or basically shed their skin or outer exoskeleton in order to grow because that hard exoskeleton does not grow along with the animal. And these exoskeletons support and provide protection from predators and harsh conditions for the arthropods. And this protection is likely why arthropods were the first animals to venture onto land, and that's because they wouldn't dry up due to being protected by their exoskeleton. Additionally, each time an arthropod molts, it allows it to change radically in between molting periods, and this can be seen, for example, in metamorphosis of butterflies. However, molting can also cause disadvantages. For example, arthropods have a size limit. They can't get too large, or they will be crushed under their own weight after molting due to not having the support of that skeleton directly after molting, because they have to wait for a new exoskeleton to harden. Most arthropod exoskeletons are made up of organic chitinous material. However, some arthropods such as trilobites and ostracods have mineralized exoskeletons made of calcite. And because organic material is not easily preserved, however, calcite is easily preserved, arthropods with calcitic exoskeletons preserve way more often than those with organic exoskeletons. This is why trilobites and ostracods, as we'll see later in this video, are a lot more common in the fossil record of arthropods and are also very important index fossils for certain periods throughout Earth's history. However, there are ways for the arthropods with organic exoskeletons to preserve. For example, they can preserve in amber, which is often how most other arthropods are found in the rock record. So now to get to arthropod classification, we have five major subphyla that are classified under the phylum arthropoda. These include trilobitomorpha, aka the trilobites, which we're going to be talking about in the next arthropod video and chelicerata or chelicerates, which include arachnids such as spiders, eurypterids, which are also shown here and are nicknamed sea scorpions, and we'll talk about why later. Then we also have crustacea, which includes many groups that we'll talk about later, but in the example shown here, we have a fossilized lobster. Then we have insecta or hexapoda, which are insects that includes these examples of a dragonfly fossil as well as a mosquito fossil shown here preserved in amber and many other groups that we'll talk about later as well. Then we have Myriapoda, which includes centipedes, millipedes, and related organisms. So before we get into the specifics of each group, we need to talk a little bit about the major differences between each main group that we showed here. Of course, we're excluding in this figure the trilobites, which we'll be talking about in the other video. So what we have here is a figure showing the other four major groups and their general structure. First, we have the chelicerates, which have a prosoma or both their head and thorax. Then they have 
have their opistosoma or their abdomen. And then they also have pedipalps, which are their second appendages, second to their first appendages, which are their chelicerae. And these chelicerae are specialized mouth parts and the pedipalps are the second pair of appendages that in some chelicerates can be modified into pincers. And all chelicerates have these four pairs of legs, which are all attached to their head. Also, chelicerates have uniramous appendages, meaning that they're unbranched. And we'll see in these other groups that sometimes arthropods can have branched appendages, in which case they're called biramous or polyramous appendages. So in the Myriapoda, we see that these have a head and a trunk region. And these guys have four pairs of appendages, a pair of antennae, a pair of mandibles, and two pairs of maxillae. And this is a characteristic they share with the insecta or hexapoda group. Additionally, myriapodes include centipedes and millipedes, which contrary to popular belief, don't actually have a hundred and a thousand legs respectively. Actually, centipedes have anywhere from around 20 to 300 legs, and millipedes typically have 36 to 400 legs. But there are other morphological differences between centipedes and millipedes that we'll talk about later. Lastly, for myriapodes, they have biramous limbs, like we talked about, meaning that they have branched limbs or appendages. Then we can move on to the crustaceans, which share a characteristic with the insects in that they have a distinct head, thorax, and segmented abdomen. Additionally, they have two pairs of antennae, a pair of maxillae, and two pairs of mandibles. And they also have biramous limbs, similar to myriapodes. Lastly, we have insecta, which we already mentioned, have a pair of antennae, mandibles, and two pairs of maxillae. And they have usually uniramous limbs, similar to chelicerates. So now that we have the general morphological differences of these four groups laid out, let's talk a little bit about the classification of the first major group we'll talk about, and this is the chelicerates. This classification scheme can be broken down into three major classes of chelicerates. These include arachnids, which have a time range from the Cambrian to the present, and include spiders, daddy long legs, which actually aren't true spiders and belong to their own group under arachnids, and scorpions, pseudoscorpions, whip scorpions, or vinegaroons, ticks, mites, and chiggers. What a wonderful group of organisms. <laughs> then we have Eurypterids, which went from the Ordovician to the Permian. These are the only extinct class of chelicerates, and these are nicknamed sea scorpions because they lived in the ocean, and as we can see, they kind of look like giant sea scorpions. And these guys were anywhere from around a foot to eight feet long, which is why I'm grateful that Eurypterids have gone extinct. However, Eurypterids are really nice to have in the rock record because they were very very abundant during the Silurian and Devonian and act as very good index fossils for that period in time. Additionally, they were the top predators of their time, leading to critical defensive adaptations in other species and driving the evolution of Paleozoic fauna. The last class we have here is the Cyphosaura or horseshoe crabs, which range from the Silurian to the present. Despite their misleading name, they are not even within the same subphylum of true crabs. They are chelicerates and they have a large prosoma or their head and thorax, and they have a long sword-like teslon, which is basically what we call their tail, and that's where they get their name. Siphos means sword in Greek, and eura means tail, so siphos, sora. And these horseshoe crabs typically come out at night and eat things like bivalves, worms, and other soft invertebrates. However, an interesting tidbit I learned while reading about this is that in the lab, they're actually known to enjoy a dog biscuit or two, which is, you know, interesting to me. I'd love to have a horseshoe crab and feed it dog biscuits all day. So anyway, let's move on now to crustaceans. Crustaceans is the next major subphylum that we talked about for the phylum Arthropoda. Crustaceans include five major classes, including Remiopedia, Cephalocarida, Branchiopoda, Malacostraca, and Maxillopoda. Unfortunately, the first three classes listed here are not very well preserved in the rock record due to their small size and lack of hard parts. However, we'll be focusing on Malacostraca and Maxillopoda. Malacostraca, for example, includes subclasses Phylocarida and Eumalacostraca, and Maxillopoda includes subclasses Cirripedia and, and Ostracoda. And the subclass Eumalacostraca of the Malacostraca class includes superorders Syncarida, Eocarida, Paracarida, and Eucarida. And Eucarida includes orders 
Euphosiacea, and Decapoda, and Decapoda includes important infraorders such as Brachiora or true crabs, Palinura or spiny lobsters, Anomira, which includes three major groups of arthropods we see today, including sand crabs, hermit crabs, and king crabs, and Astacidia includes regular lobsters, which differ from spiny lobsters in that they have their big pincers, whereas the spiny lobsters don't, they just have another pair of legs. And then Astacidia also includes crayfish. And then lastly, we have Thalassinidia, which includes ghost and mud shrimp. And then if we move back over to the left to our subclasses of Maxillopoda rather than Malacostraca, we have our Cirripedia subclass, aka barnacles, and then we have our Ostracoda subclass, aka ostracods. And ostracods are very important for the fossil record. Like we mentioned earlier, these are one of the few groups of arthropods that actually secretes a mineralized exoskeleton made of calcite that can be more easily preserved than the organic exoskeleton of most other arthropods. So to go a little bit more detail on ostracods, because these do have a more extensive fossil record than most other arthropods, we have here some information regarding this group in which we see that ostracods have lasted from the early Cambrian to the present and are the most common arthropod in the fossil record, including trilobites. They're even more abundant in trilobites. And like we said, this is because they secrete a calcite exoskeleton, and in their case, they secrete two shells as their exoskeleton, similar to bivalves, but their body is definitely an arthropod. It's just their shells that are similar to bivalves. And because of their tiny size, their rapid evolution, and their extensive fossil record, they are often used for biostratigraphy. And they are useful not only for biostratigraphy, but also paleoecology and paleoceanography, because of a lot of ostracod groups have specific associations with specific oceanographic conditions, making them good indicators for those specific conditions. Additionally, they are filter feeders and they live on or burrowed under the sea floor or attached sometimes to the stems of plants. And they can live in fresh brackish saline or even hypersaline waters. And they live at all depths up to 7,000 meters in depth in the sea. And so they're extremely versatile, not only in terms of salinity and location, but also in terms of depth in the water. And some even live on land in damp moss or super tidal regions. Additionally, a tidbit I found cool while reading about these is that they can proliferate different terrestrial aquatic environments like lakes or ponds by transporting themselves through the air, either because they're so tiny they can be picked up and blown by wind into adjacent ponds, but another way they can be transported is through being incorporated in the mud that is picked up by birds on their feet. And that's crazy. I mean, that just tells you how tiny these organisms really are and how they can be picked up just by being in the mud that is in these animals' feet. And so that is a couple ways they can be transported by air and why they proliferate in so many different environments. And lastly, before we move on, I want to point out that this picture to the bottom left is what they look like in thin section. And as we can see, this is their shell that looks superficially like a brachiopod and maybe a bivalve in thin section. However, if we put this to scale and notice that this is 200 micron scale, then we know that that this is an ostracod. Ostracods average a size of about two millimeters and the largest that has ever lived has been 80 millimeters, but in general they're very tiny and so we can tell that brachiopods which get up to inches are very different than ostracods in thin section or in rock slabs that we examine. So now let's move on to the subphylum Insecta. Insects are the largest group of arthropods and are the most diverse group of animals on the planet. And so these are a very important group of arthropods to study. However, in paleontology, like we mentioned earlier, they don't preserve very well unless they're in like amber or something. And so we're just going to briefly talk about what we do know about insect evolution throughout time. However, the fossil record is largely incomplete for insects. And so there's a lot of information we probably don't know just due to the fact that the evidence has been erased because these guys don't preserve very well. But if we look at this slide, we can see that in the figure to the left, we have primitive types of insects such as silverfish and bristletails at the bottom of this evolutionary tree of insects. And these were wingless forms and, you know, still survive to today. But these evolved into winged insects eventually around the early Pennsylvanian, or at least to our knowledge. Some studies show that it might be even in the Mississippian that winged insects came along. But basically this subclass of winged insects is called Teriagoda. And it wasn't until later that more advanced insects, such as those that undergo complete 
complete metamorphosis, like caterpillars, grubs, and maggots, showed up. And these major plant pollinators, like butterflies, moths, and bees, radiated during the Jurassic to the Cretaceous. That says Jurassico. Um, that's supposed to say Jurassic. So anyway, in this time period, they started to radiate, and this is thought to be in co-evolutionary response to the appearance of flowering plants or angiosperms. Lastly, the only order of insecta to appear later than the Mesozoic during the tertiary was the fleas. And this was likely due to mammal diversification since fleas rely on mammals because they are parasites of mammals. The last subphylum of arthropods we'll talk about today is the Myriapoda subphylum. These include, like we mentioned earlier, millipedes and centipedes, and living millipedes are within the class Diplopoda. And these are scavengers that live in rotting vegetation, and they actually cannot bite or kill prey. So if you see a millipede, you don't need to be worried. And in terms of fossilization, some preserved burrows of possible millipedes in Ordovician sediment suggest that millipedes were the first animals to move onto land. The centipedes, however, are in the subclass Chilopoda and have a more flattened body and longer legs than the millipedes. Additionally, they can move faster than the millipedes, and they are also predators that bite and inject venom and paralyze their prey. And so if you are wondering which one to worry about, centipedes are the group of myriapodes that I would worry about. Millipedes, I can chill with. And an extinct relative of millipedes called the Arthropurida reached over 2.6 meters or around eight and a half feet. This is the largest land arthropod to ever have lived, or at least to our knowledge based on the fossil record. And there were also other large forms of arthropods during the time that Arthropurida lived during the Carboniferous, and these include large forms of Eurypterids shown in figure A, large trilobites shown in figure B, and large dragonflies shown in figure C. And then we have Arthropurida shown in figure D, all relative to the size of humans shown in the little shadow figure surrounded by all these crazy organisms. And the reason that all these Carboniferous organisms were getting so big is likely due to the high atmospheric oxygen and the way that arthropods grow and sustain their huge body size is benefited by this high atmospheric oxygen. However, I'm quite glad that these groups of arthropods have now gone extinct. And with that, I want to remind you guys that we have the second arthropod video coming up in which we'll talk about the trilobites or the subphylum trilobitomorpha and all of the orders of trilobites within that group. And then we'll have the next phylum, the echinoderms, coming up after that. And with that, thanks again for watching and I can't wait to see you guys next time. Bye. Unerimus? 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 Unerimus?